All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Arthur. I'm a research fellow at Monash University, and today I'm going to talk to you about a project we've been running for a while, uh, where we're building a um, real-time condition-aware routing system at scale. So we're trying to route the entirety of Melbourne, really. Uh, so the, the main focus of this project is to get a real-time system. By real-time, we mean something that we can adjust, so we can uh, enforce some form of time budget on the search. We can do some form of like bounded suboptimal search. Basically, we can tweak the quality of the search uh, to, to gain more speed. And we want to avoid any repairs because we want the system to be fully online. I'll touch on why we don't want to repair a bit later. Um, so we use a fairly decent data set of Melbourne where we have a graph of the road network in Melbourne that has about 170,000 nodes, 460,000 edges. And we've got a query set that has about 650,000 queries. Um, and so what we focused on, what we're really interested in is 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 to try to to take congestion into account. So just doing routing is is fairly straightforward, but doing routing at scale with a changing metric. So when the congestion is moving, so like traffic on the road is changing, is very uh, is a lot more challenging. Uh, so we've generated a congestion profile for the morning peak hour in slices of five minutes. It's between eight and nine a.m. and we're able to change that a bit at will. And finally, our system is distributed. We want to have like a scalable routing engine. We want to be able to have a system where we can just add more machines and make it make it faster. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a bit about the, the what data we have and how we use it. Uh, so this is a visualization of our query set. Uh, so this is a map of the greater Melbourne area. Um, and the colors vary from fairly light or no color, where we have either no requests or very few requests and to fairly dark, we have a lot of demand. So these are commuter trips. It's data that's avail available freely online. Um, and we've been uh, using that. <clears throat> and now for our changing metrics, the thing we're interested in, again, is, is how does congestion evolve through time? So we, we simulated a model of Melbourne to get some congestion. And here's a picture of the CBD of Melbourne at peak hour, so like around uh, 8 AM. And basically, all these yellow arcs you can see on the on the map um, have an increase of about twenty thousand percent in cost. So, so, so in simple terms, these are impassable in the morning. So, really, the, the advice is: do not drive through the CBD of Melbourne at peak hour. It's not worth it. Uh, now, like our focus, I said, is the changing metric. But not only we want the metric to change uh, through time, we want to be able to customize that metric per query. And so that's what we looked at. And that's why we want to avoid repairs. So here is a a, a, a plot of using kind of the state of the art in repairable um, search algorithms, which is customizable contraction hierarchies, CCH on the on the plot here. So here, what we're looking at is a plot where we measure the average time per query in microseconds. So that's the y-axis, depending on the number of customizations we need. So that's the x-axis, right? So at zero, we don't need to customize anything. So we have we start with a contraction hierarchy, and we just route everything. And it works really well, like you know, about 33 microseconds. And then as we need, to, we start to need customizing, we can see the cost increases. And you can see this, this, this curve doesn't look too good when we reach a certain point where it's starting to take a lot of time. Basically, having to pay the cost of repairing the, 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 the contraction hierarchy all the time is starting to take a toll. So much so that actually at some point, uh, it is faster to, to use just that extra. So like no pre-computation or nothing and just to root uh, our demands. And that occurs at around 78,000 um, repairs needed. And so we, we, we started looking into having uh, a, like a method that doesn't need repairs and could be faster. And so we've developed something called Oracle Search. Um, and that becomes competitive at about seven, 1,700 uh, customizations needed. So, so basically, the point we're trying to make here is that uh, customizable contractual hierarchies are very, very efficient so long as they can um, amortize the cost of customizing, the cost of customizing of a mini queries, right? Uh, at some point, it becomes uh, better to have an algorithm that doesn't need to repair at all and can just run online. Um, okay, so so the algorithm that we've developed is called Oracle Search, and it's a mixture of A star with a search oracle. So more precisely, here a first move oracle. Uh, the difference between an oracle and a heuristic is really that an oracle returns a concrete path. But mainly now I'm going to just introduce you quickly to a first move oracle and how they work. So 
how we build one is we have to compute an all pairs shortest path. So here we're looking at one iteration of that algorithm. Uh, so we're just pre-computing a first move table from that yellow tile in the, in the center called O. And basically the letters you see recorded in all the other tiles are which first move is needed to go to this tile from O. So for example, the top left corner, it's W, so we need to go west. So from O, if I want to go to the top left corner, I need to go west once, okay? So what happens is we build this huge table that you see on the right. It's a very like, you know, uh, easy, like very simple representation of the first move table. It would be like, you know, 32 by 32 grid. Uh, we need to record one first move for every entry. And so from O, we get this row that contains all the first moves. I want to go towards D. So as I mentioned, the first move is going west. Now we need to extract a new row. And this new row is going to tell us, okay, from where I am now, the direction towards D is northwest. And then again, northwest, and then north, and now we found a target. It's, it's, it's pretty efficient. So there is no search involved when running an Oracle. We can just have a recursive procedure that extracts all the moves. However, as I'm as I've shown here, you need to query the table at different rows every time you make a move. Now, I wanna show you something interesting. If we flip that table, so we just transpose this move table and now we index by target. So I've got a row that contains the first move towards the, from all the other tiles in the grid. Now, an uh, interesting phenomenon happen, happens, right? So what's my first move from O towards D? So we said it's west. And then from that new tile towards D, it's northwest, northwest again, and then north. But the interesting thing, as you can see, is that the row hasn't changed. We just have one row and we query this single row. So this leads to something interesting, right? Now the search only needs to know about that single row. So the Oracle is much smaller. The Oracle for a given query is only one row. Even more interesting than that, the Oracle for any query with the same target is still a single row. And so that allows us to distribute this Oracle much more efficiently as opposed to before. Because if we have an origin index Oracle, we need to, each search needs to know about the entirety of the Oracle to be able to root. But now, we only need this single row to route all the queries towards a given target. And so we can say, okay, we can have different threads responsible for different subsets of the database. So in summary, uh, Oracle search is a combination of A star with a first move Oracle. Um, like I'm gonna show you some, some numbers on like running, like building one for Melbourne. And we have this running some, so we're running some search on a consistent network. We have about 90% of our queries that are affected, so they need some search. Our baseline again is Dijkstra. Dijkstra doesn't need any any um, any indexing and any pre-computation, so it doesn't take any size, it's zero, uh, and it has a speed of one, obviously it's a baseline. And now we're comparing the origin and target indexing. So remember, this is the same algorithm, we just change how the Oracle is. Uh, so they both have the same size, it's first move stable, so it's like you know N squared in the size of the graph. Um, so first of all, using an origin index, we already 63 times faster than Dijkstra, so that's pretty good, like you know, that's kind of the results we, we, we want. Um, but now the interesting thing is if we index by target, not only do we get this, this better memory behavior, but we also get a better cache behavior in the search. And we again, 20% faster than the origin index. So remember, this is just data locality at this point. We're just because we can query the one row and we don't need to go back and forth to the table. Okay, so, so using this, this Oracle that now we know is very efficient and we can slice it, we built our distributed system. So our distributed system, uh, we have a little um, experimental setup which runs on six Intel nukes. So they're like very tiny boxes, uh, system on chips. They run uh, some i7s and they have about 32 gigs of RAM. Uh, we dedicate one to be the driver. And so this one's connected to the internet and you receive queries. Then as it receives queries, it will partition them. And these partitions are basically allocating the queries that have you know, the right targets to the right workers. Then each worker is responsible for only a part of the database. So if we go back to the numbers quickly, we've got five workers, our database about 14 gigs. So each worker is responsible for about, you know, two to three gigabytes of, of data. It's still quite a bit, but it's much smaller. And the good thing is we can expand it. If we add workers for free, we get like, you know, an Oracle that's thin, that's sliced thinner, but we don't need to change anything else. Okay, so like the main metric we're interested in uh, in the system is the throughput. So the number of queries we can process per second. So here, here what I'm showing is um, the results when we're doing bounded suboptimal search. 
So at the, on the x-axis, we can see the search bound. So at 1.0, we're running optimal search. So we want all paths to be optimal. And 1.3, we have 30% so optimality guarantee. So decent results, in my opinion. Uh, if we're doing optimal search, we run about 125,000 queries per second. So it takes about five seconds to process our entire query set, which is fairly reasonable considering it spans the entire day. However, if we run a 30% of optimality gap, then we can route over half a million queries per second. So it takes us like you know one less than one and a half seconds to route the entirety of the demand in Melbourne for the entire day. So that's pretty good. I mean, at least I'm pretty happy about these results. Um, now I want to draw your attention to something interesting. We measured what we call the ideal setup in blue here, uh, these new numbers. And in a way, this ideal setup is measuring the throughput directly on the workers. So in this case, we are meeting the communication overheads between the driver to the workers, because think about it this way. The driver receives a bunch of queries, it partitions them, and then it sends them to the workers, and the workers receive them, and then have to process them, right? So that means we're reading every query at least twice. So there's some overheads, like in terms of like communication and everything. So we need to take these things, in, these things into account when we're building a distributed system. Um, but now the thing I want to point to, which I find interesting, is not so much the raw numbers of just running on the workers, but rather how the gap widens as the search bound becomes bigger, right? So if we're doing optimal search, uh, running, omitting the uh, communication overheads gives us an improvement of about 50% speed, which is already pretty good. I mean, uh, I'll take it. Uh, however, at 30% of optimality, the gap widens to like 100%. We're twice as fast running things if we omit the communication overheads. So the phenomenon that's happening here, there's something we call having the workers starved. Basically, the workload or like the difficulty of solving the queries becomes too low, it's too easy, and we're too fast at processing these queries versus the cost of transferring them. Okay, so we need to balance these two things out. So, and that's the other thing here is that I'm talking about the entire query set. So I'm, I'm, I'm rooting 6 650,000 queries um, on the cluster, if I had only 10,000, then these overheads would be even higher. Okay, so we need to be able to balance these things out. Um, another plot I find interesting, personally, here we're looking at using a time limit. So we're allocating a maximum search time per query. Uh, so that's that's very good in a context where we want to say something like, we want to give a guarantee to users in the, in the form, uh, we're going to give you an answer within one second, whatever happens, okay? So some quick facts here. Um, if the search, if the time limit is at one millisecond, so a thousand microseconds, then we can solve every query to optimality. That's that's pretty good. Uh, so we know we don't need to do anything about this. But now what becomes interesting is when we shift that time limit. So if we say, okay, we only allocate three hundred microseconds per query, then we've got about three percent of queries which can't be solved to optimality. However, the maximum sub optimality gap is five percent. So that would be equivalent to the, the previous plot when we're at 1.05 at 1 sub optimality, right? These are roughly the same throughputs, the same results. But that gives us different knobs we can tweak. We can either say, okay, I don't care about optimality, or I care mostly about time. And that's very important in that sort of real time system. Finally, if we give 30 microseconds, so this is really short, remember that's the baseline for CCH, um, then we get about 70% of queries solved to optimality, which is pretty good. Um, However, we can see that there's this, this, this gap that widens very quickly towards the last percentile of, of, of queries, and that rises to about 41%. So like at worst, uh, we can only give a, an answer that's like within 40% of its optimal. That's all we know. All right, to wrap this up, uh, we have built a proof of concept of a system that can give direct driving directions at city scale. It's extremely fast, it's real time. Um, and we know about the whole paths, so that's, that's very, very good. Uh, we can do customized routing, so we are able to change the metric per query at no cost. And this is something that was very important to us and that we've managed to do, like quite happy about it. So, and we do it by having a system that requires no repair and has a fully online search algorithm. So we can have like an anytime sort of search where we return paths as we need them. We don't do that because of our heads, obviously. And finally, it's a distributed system <clears throat> And that is, uh, we can scale the system with no additional overheads. So obviously, we still have the overheads, the default overheads of the system. But if we added more machines to our system, we would just go faster without paying anything.
All right, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. We've got a website. Uh, flick me an email as you prefer. Thank you.